two meanings, and you can eliminate one of those meanings from showing up by typing minus in a related word. If you're trying to search for A, but you keep getting B instead, you can use the minus tool to narrow down that search. The opposite of the minus is the tilde. This little sign, you hold shift and you hit that before one. You get a tilde. That searches related words. We're now searching George Mason debate and the word institute. And any word that Google thinks is similar to the word institute. The tilde is awesome because it solves a lot of the effort that you have to put into creativity. A large part of getting the best evidence for something is synonym generation. If you look for our lab is pondering what after right, one of the apps we're pondering is vocational schools. Schools where, trade schools, where you get skills that aren't necessarily uh, the type of skills that are going to be taught in a school like George Mason, but electrical work and engineering work. If you look for just vocational schools and secondary education, you might miss the most amazing, fantastic education reform article because it calls them trade schools and not vocational schools. Synonym generation is important to make sure you're looking at all of the available evidence on a subject. Using just a slightly different word could mean the best article for what you're looking for never shows up. The tilde is an imperfect but useful shortcut for synonym generation because Google knows a lot of synonyms. And when you type tilde, it maps out all its synonyms and searches for those synonyms. Perhaps you're starting to see how I was not lying when I said this lecture would not be the most exciting thing in the world. It's search operators. It's math of how to get those search operators right. That's part of doing good, effective research. I'm going to keep going over it. 
Other important things you can do in Google. Two buttons here, settings and tools. Tools allows you to do date restrictions. Useful for two reasons. You want uniqueness cards. For a dis ad, you only want to look in the past month. You got a past month button. You want the past three months? You just switch it to custom range and type in 3 1 2017 to, I'm just going to type 2019. So there's basically no end restriction. Now I'm doing a search for articles that were published in the last three months. This can be useful in the other direction too. Sometimes things are too recent. Sometimes Google prioritizes recent articles. And so some controversy might be clouding the research on something. Maybe Trump did something ridiculous talking about proliferation and you're just getting a bunch of bad articles talking about how Trump did something ridiculous and not getting actually good articles that you want on proliferation, you can change the search restriction to exclude the last month, the last three months, the last two years. So you're still getting recent articles and information, but you're maybe getting past that bubble of Google prioritizing the most recent things, even though in this case recency may not be the best thing for you. Next, file type PDF. Typing file type colon PDF means that you're only going to get responses that are PDF files. Any idea why that might be useful? It's a shortcut filter for screening out low quality sources. Oftentimes, high quality evidence, perhaps think tank, perhaps peer reviewed, will publish their evidence in a peer reviewed format. Now, doing this search is a good way to make sure you're getting high quality stuff right off the bat, or at least more high quality stuff, but it will leave out some really good stuff. A professor who's qualified the field, who's taught for 20 years, writing on their blog about secondary education reform to open up more pathways to vocational schools, might have an awesome article. It's a cool solvency advocate for an F, a disadvantage, a critique. And you'll miss that if you only do file type PDF. But at the same time, doing both is very useful. File type PDF restricts your search in a way that produces a bunch of good responses. So you can see some really useful information right off the top. But good researchers are also going to aim for depth. They're going to find the other sources too. And that's a shortcut to high quality searches. Okay. The last thing I'm going to teach you about Google searches are proximity searches. Some of you have made us, may have noticed the school choice app refers to the use of peer reviewed evidence as a gold standard for evidence. Proximity searches are the gold standard for research. Quotations took a couple of ideas and said, I want to search for this, but only when they're in this exact order right next to each other. Proximity search takes an idea. Vocational schools and secondary education. If I do this search, vocational schools and secondary education, it is going to search for those four words anywhere on a page, no matter what order they show up in. I'm going to clean this up a little bit by adding quotation marks to the two phrases I care about, vocational schools and secondary education. Now I'm going to put a connector in the middle. I could type and, but Google auto fills that in. It's already searching for both of those concepts. Instead, I'm going to type near slash 10, or near slash 35. This will now search for the phrase vocational schools within 35 words of secondary education. This is important because it only returns searches with a tight link between those two concepts. Instead of a thousand page report that has the word, the phrase vocational schools on page one and the phrase secondary education on page 677, they now have to be within 35 words of each other. 
which will massively increase the relevance of your search results. Secondary education, near 35, vocational schools, increases the tightness with which those two concepts are bound. And playing with the numeric value is important to, uh, allows you to loosen and tighten how much those concepts have to be bound. We massively loosen it, and now we have an article on Turkish asylum seekers. Somehow the words vocational schools and education reform or secondary education appear in that, but if we go back to our tightly bound search, we're seeing things that seem much more connected. And if I wanted to make the search more refined, I'd probably add the word reform. Now remember we talked about how vocational schools might be excluding trade schools, so I put a tilde in front of vocational schools, and now I might also be getting trade schools. I used to coach Jackie a long time ago, giving a different version of this lecture. I said, the best searches will look like math. You will have Boolean operators that are making your search very refined. So you get exactly what you want that jumps to the very top of your search. The more your searches look like math, you might be doing something right. And Google's pretty smart on its own, so if you just search vocational schools and educational reform or secondary education, you might get some good hits right at the top anyway. But these restrictions make it a lot quicker. Last two things about Google. Google Scholar and Google Books. Scholar.google.com and books.google.com. These search different things than regular Google. Google Scholar such as peer-reviewed scholarly articles published in academic journals. Another way to shortcut yourself to high-quality research. Google Books, obviously, it searches books. Some of them can be popular, but many are going to be scholarly. Many are going to be comprehensive and thorough, regardless of whether or not they put the modifier scholar. And that, both of those things can produce very good evidence. Okay. Google was free, you had it before. Now you're on George Mason's campus. You get new stuff. You go to library.gmu.edu and you will be taken to this page. George Mason University subscribes to a number of ridiculously expensive educational databases. One of the ones that we'll talk about is EBSCOhost. EBSCOhost is a collection of articles published by different journals. It's just professors, mostly, writing, reviews of any concept they want to. Has a bunch of journals in it. How much do you think a subscription to EBSCO most costs? Just like professors wanting to write some stuff. Back right. $350 a year. Who else? $350 a month. So $350 times 12, can anyone do math? $4,000 a year. No, what do you think? How much does EBSCO host cost? $200,000. $200,000 a year. That's a lot of money. More like 10K. 10K a year? One more guess. Back right. Two grand. Half a million dollars a year. Ooh. EBSCO host costs George Mason University $500,000 a year. And you used to have to have a student ID to use it. But if you have a guest internet account, and you are physically on campus, logged into that guest internet account, you can now use five, a resource that costs $500,000 a year. That's one database. George Mason has over ballpark 500 distinct databases that they pay for. We're going to talk about EBSCOhost. We're going to talk about LexisNexis. By time, we'll touch on resources called Project Views and JSTOR. LexisNexis is more expensive than EBSCOhost. I don't know how much JSTOR project views costs, but you are easily, easily going to be given access to resources that cost $2 million per year, at least, that you can now use for free by virtue of standing on this campus. To access those, you see three tabs right here, quick search, books and more, articles and more. You click articles and more, and it's giving you three fields. We're going to care about these letters. The letters are the 
databases organized alphabetically. Now, if you know exactly what the article you want is, you can go to the second bar that, search, that says search journals and publications. And if you know the article you want, you can type that in. But if you don't have an article in mind and you just know I told you there are some good databases, then you're going to go alphabetically. First thing we're going to learn is LexisNexis. So we're going to click L. L takes us to all of the databases that George Mason has. Organized alphabetically, we care about Lexis, Nexus, Academic, Law, and News. Lexis, Nexus, Law, and News. We're now at the LexisNexis homepage. LexisNexis is a database that contains almost every major and minor newspaper in the country and a bunch more in the world down to your local city paper, up to the Times, the Post, and it contains law reviews. Hmm? Law reviews are an amazing resource for you. People in the field of law, writing about the law and public policy, and they publish normative articles about how the law should change on virtually every subject. Do you care about the health of the oceans? There are 10,000 law reviews on that. Do you care about critical legal studies or critical race studies? There are 10,000 law reviews on that. Do you care about whether or not the super volcano under Yellowstone is 10,000 years overdue for an explosion that will wipe out the entire continent? Well, there's like 500 law reviews on that. Law reviews, I don't know why, they're written about everything, every kind of public policy, and they're in-depth, well-documented resources that you can access. LexisNexis gives you access to 95% of the law reviews that are written in this country. Right off the bat, on this page, you can see this advanced options. Down here, you can see you're searching four things. Company profiles, law reviews, state and federal cases, and newspapers. Right now, I care about law reviews, so I'm going to uncheck everything but that. I've never used company profiles before. State and federal cases is useful occasionally. It searches that actual court decisions. Anytime an appellate court, Supreme Court, State Supreme Court uh, makes a decision on a public policy issue, there's a lengthy reasoning of why, and any judges on that panel who dissented or had a separate dissenting opinion. And LexisNexis allows you to search those from the Supreme Court down to your state appellate courts. That can be useful, but right now I care about law reviews. Somebody give me a topic of something you're researching. You gotta be researching something. You had two research sessions. Uh, we've done vocational schools. Can you give me something else. Anti blackness. This is not the primary institution I would go for. And I'm gonna retool a little bit to say the critical race study. Uh, because that is what the legal scholars will use. Well, let's give it a shot. You have 23 law reviews that fit the term anti-blackness. Um, Middle Atlantic People of Color Conference, the Ghost of White Supremacy, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, and the Specters of Drag, Black Criminality. Persistent white supremacist, relentless, relentless anti-blackness, and the limits of the law. I don't know. Limits of the law, that strikes me as something that might be uh, useful for what I think you are aiming at researching. So, a mental note, bookmark that. You might want to come back to that. I'm going to retool and say critical race theory, because I think in a law journal, that's going to get a lot more. We go back to Project Muse or JSTOR later on, I think anti blackness is going to have thousands of hits instead of tens of hits. So, we'll say critical race theory. And we care about education policy. So we're going to say critical race theory and education. This case matters. Sorry? This case does not matter. But this is not a proximity search. This is just, law reviews are tens of thousands of words long. And critical race theory could appear in a footnote. Education could appear in a footnote. We want to search for these ideas tightly bound together. The Boolean language is a little bit different with LexisNexis. It is not near slash, it's W slash. 
we're going to type critical race theory within w slash 45, within 45 words of education. 641 law reviews talk about critical race theory within 45 words of education. Now, if I wanted to type this up even more, I could say education reform or education policy. The Google tilde no longer works, but you get a new tool, the exclamation mark, which is a wild card. It'll search for education or educate or educates meaning it'll search for different variables of the word education. So you don't miss an article that looks really awesome just because it has some minor different use of the word education. 737 articles, we expanded our scope a little. Now, remember it was about 600 articles if we use a proximity search. If we don't use a proximity search, the gold standard of research, we get 1,000 plus. Now, whenever Lexis returns more than a thousand hits, it automatically doesn't show you some of them, and it auto sorts them by relevance. Now, that doesn't have to be terrible, but generally, anytime you've hit a thousand plus search in LexisNexis, and you've let LexisNexis take over how it sorts the results for you, you haven't done an optimal search. That proximity search, this could be ten thousand results, and a lot of them are not going to be good for you. Making it a proximity search ensures that they are going to be, the concepts are going to be more tightly bound. Now, there are a lot of different databases, Google, LexisNexis, EBSCO, Project Muse, JSCOR, just the ones I'm going to talk about if I have time. And there are a lot of different differences in the language that is used by those search engines. Near within number, near slash number, W slash number. The good news is, all of these websites have very easy to use search tip page. So if you ever forget how to do a proximity search within a particular search engine, you could just type in Google, Google proximity search. Or you could go to Google and type LexisNexis proximity search. Or usually it's very easy to find their own uh, help page on the website. Like if I control F help, oh, it's right here. And that will take me to tips and tricks for doing searches. Okay, a few other cool things about LexisNexis before we move on. My favorite button in the world is right here. It says show. Right now we're showing search results in a list format. I prefer expanded list. What expanded list does is it shows you every time your search words are used under the conditions that you searched for them. So this is showing us every time critical race theory appears within 45 words of the word education in the article. What this expanded relevance function does is it allows you to figure out which articles are useful and which articles aren't useful without opening them, which I think is a huge time saver. It's a customized preview. It's giving you a preview of the article on the terms that you set, which I think is incredibly helpful at making research a quick and efficient process because you'd be like, oh, the term isn't used in a useful way for me. I'm throwing it out as something relevant. But this article looks like it's talking about critical race theory a lot in the context of education. And I think it looks like we've got a lot of good articles here. Uh, lack print or Latin critical race theory and critical race theory in the content in the field of education and dialogue between scholars. I think a lot of this looks like it would be really good if we were trying to write a critical lot for the top. My time is right now. So rather than teach you every Boolean operator for Lexis, which you can look up on a tips page yourself, I want to show you the other three databases that I care about. I want you to know how to use four of the university's multi-million dollar subscriptions. The four ones you should write down are LexisNexis, EBSCOhost, Project Views, and JSTOR. LexisNexis is great for uniqueness work, dissonance, because you get all the, every newspaper article in the country, and the law review portion is good for virtually everything else. There's only a slight weakness on the K side. 
A weakness that we've shown can be adjusted if you know what you're looking for. EBSCO host, EVSCO. Which I've got to by going to econlit and then we're going to rephrase Mason organizes EBSCO host under academic search complete. So you would just do a search for A in the databases list and find it under academic search complete. EBSCO host is similar to Lexis in terms of what you're going to get. You're going to get academic articles and newspapers on a wide range of subjects with only a slight weakness at critical work. Uh, it has multiple boxes for you to enter search phrases in, and you can adjust with the phrase and, or, or not. You can always add more boxes, which is EBSCO's version of way of making searching just a little bit easier for you. You can do everything you can do in EBSCO and Lexis in this one box. But now you can search vocational tool and secondary education and education reform. And it just makes it a little bit easier because instead of worrying about having to write down all the sort of mathy ways to do order of operations, that's what searching is, it's order of operations. You can get it all in different boxes. That's good. I'm like in red. That's fine. Other two project views and JSTOR. These are going to have more critical resources, critical scholarship. My time is up, so I'm just showing you what the home pages look like. Two big lessons. One. You have millions of dollars, no hyperbole, of resources at your access. Please use them. I've shown you my four favorite or most commonly used databases. Experiment with them. If you're having trouble, ask a lab leader. Second big lesson, perseverance. Sometimes you can spend a day looking for one article that says what you want it to say. And if you spend seven hours looking for one article, you might feel like your productivity is low. But honestly, sometimes it's not. Because when you find a good article, that article does three things for you. One, it's got good cards in it. Two, it's got footnotes and citations that show you everyone else smart who's written on that topic in the past. Finding one good article means finding a hundred good articles. Because you can research backwards through the citations. Because they're citing everyone who's worked in that field. If it's a good article, they're showing you all the previous good scholarship on that. And you can go forward. Google Scholar has this cited by search function. So if you find a great article, you can search for everyone who has cited that article. For everyone who's written about that article. Which means you can use the bibliography of an article to search backward in time. You can use Google Scholar cited by function to search forward in time, meaning that one good article creates a web of research for you that is already done. You can research that web back and forward, which means you only need one good article to get a great start on a file or an idea or an argument. Okay. I'm going to hand it off to Deb for research And so research in K-Debate is not much different than research in traditional debate. It's still scholarly, but it's a little bit more expansive. And so what that means is it's solely not limited to research databases. In traditional debate, Matt, I thought did a really good job of proving to you why the validity and the credibility
credibility of the sources that you're searching for are drastically important. And so it's what Matt called high quality sources. So for instance, you can't have someone talking about the statistical benefit of things like vocational and trade school if, for instance, they're just a parent. If they haven't done the qualitative and qualitative work necessary to make them an area an expert in their area of study. In case of it, however, that's not entirely true. You don't need a PhD or to publish in a peer-reviewed journal to be considered a qualified source. And so what that means is students with experiences in their everyday lives, parents with experiences, a poet, a singer, a rapper, a fictional novelist, a TV series, your experiences all become legitimate forms of academic knowledge to put forth proving your particular point um, and your argument. And so what I will do is I don't want to talk too much, but what I do want to do is show you if I can go out of this technology, turn this off, please. I want to show you a bunch of different examples of sources that are traditionally known as alternative academic sources that can still be legitimate in terms of a research process. Yeah. Okay, so let's say we want to think about a movie. Um, the first movie that comes to mind that I think about in terms of my area of expertise and what I'm interested in, which is race, education, hip-hop, things like that, is a movie known as Freedom Riders. Has anyone seen that movie before? No. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to look at a scene from Freedom Riders and see why and if it could be used as an academic source or um, an organic source um, in the process. So I can see this clip being played in an affirmative that's talking about how educational curriculum is disengaged from students of color lives. Okay. Yeah. So it's descriptive of a lot of the experiences 
that people of color have with the educational system. And so this, for instance, could be the top level 1AC and then an over affirmative about either rejecting reform based on the experiences or reforming from the or reforming the educational process to create a curriculum based around the lived experiences of people of color. Um, yeah, so some other alternative forms of information that can come or be used to prove a particular argument can come from film or it can come from things like music, rap, um, pop, whatever. Um, some artists that I think of that come to mind is Lauren Hill, I think will be primarily big on this topic, and she has a whole album called The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Um, but one of the songs I want to let you all listen to is I Got. I think it's stopping right here. So from the top to the bottom, what are some of the arguments that you think this song would be the last thing that could be used to make an affirmative argument? Exactly. And that's what impact turns the framework, correct? What else? Anything else? What about, um, I won't support your lies no more, I won't even try no more. If I have to die, oh Lord, that's how I choose to live. Exactly, or black nationalism, for example, right? And so these are some of the things that you have to pay attention to when you're debating critical affirmative, because just because it seems like an alternative style of evidence, just because it seems irrelevant, just because it seems like a catchy tune that they're playing at the top of a thing, just to waste time, Nine times out of ten, it's not. They're going to find a way to mobilize it to their advantage. Um, and sometimes it ends up costing you the debate that you do not engage in. And so one of the other songs that I think will be big on this year's topic, and I'm going to use it because it's very clear to me that it will work.
So what do you think we can pull away from this? What are some of the arguments that you think that Christ is making? So you see how arguments based in education, based in form, can be made from sources that traditionally you would think are included in the um, And so another thing, another style, I guess, of scholarly or non-scholarly sources, depending on your viewpoint, um, picked up from things like documentaries. So let's use the skill that Matt is part of. <laughs> Too, too reliable or dismissive in the background of 
that was choices that I considered to be alternative um, or not high quality. Because sometimes that may be the difference between winning and losing the race. Okay, Any questions? Okay. All right.